and that's coming online and it's fixing to warm up and we're fixing to be able to do some stuff. So uh, without anything else, uh, uh, Mr. Stanley's been involved with this uh, ceramics and youth and creating art and helping other people achieve their goals and helping this hunger situation. And I, I'm just looking at uh, opening some doors here, uh, thinking outside the box. I just, I just think this is something that we ought to look at. So uh, Chris, take it away. Well, you guys, thank you so much for, for inviting me today. And, and you know, what, what an absolute pleasure it's going to be to talk about something that has literally transformed my life. And I think in teaching, which from what I understand, that was a lot of your all's professions at, at different times. Um, you know, we always talk about how education, you know, we're the givers and we wait for these teachable moments with our students to kind of make these epiphanies. But this actually happened in reverse, where, where I was on one of my professorial rants, and one of the young ladies I'm going to talk about today um, just said, okay, shut up. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> okay. And, and, you know, very rarely does a student kind of come back at you like that. And, and, and I said, well, here's what I want to do. And I said, and I don't know if we can do it because I didn't have a confidence and, and, and you kind of have to put yourself into these, you know, possible stereotypes about Odessa going back 20 some odd years ago. I didn't have the confidence that my community had the empathy or the compassion to, to care about a project such as this that was going to try and bring a whole bunch of diverse people together to try and feed the poor, okay? So just real quickly, we were talking about this before. Can you guys all see this? Is everybody yeah. good? Okay. Um, that, let me get back here. The gentleman who did this graphic design is now a graphic designer for the White House, okay? So this is a young man who was a first-generation Hispanic kid who came out of Odessa. He was also a baseball player. And I used to be a catcher when I played baseball, and he was one of the first pitchers on our baseball team. He was also an art student. And before we even had our baseball stadium on campus, I used to catch for him to warm him up, which says a lot, I think, about our, our school. But you'll notice here on the logo that John built, um, you know, Odessa College, Trinity High, Midland College, and then UTPB. And so in 2005, we started to join together the schools. Um, and and it, it, in a way, if you know the history of our area, people, people didn't like that. You know, there were, there were some separate boundaries and, and lines in the sand that people didn't cross. But, but these were all, in a way, ex-students. They were also friends. And, and we just didn't pay attention to that. Um, we, we branded real heavily in some of those first events where, where um, the, the logos and the t-shirts and that, you know, we still see these t-shirts today roaming around the Permian Basin. And so every year we've tried to do a, a, a kind of like a souvenir t-shirt and, and the cooler and cooler the graphic is, the more you'll start to see it out and about in the community. So you'll see them at the grocery stores and you'll see them right around. And so the T-shirt sales actually kind of in a way were equal to the bowl sales, which we thought was real fascinating. Um, this kid is 27 years old now and is in law school in Boston. And, and so I think the, 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 um, the, the trick there is, in, you know, and, and especially you guys are, it sounds like are doing this already, but the more and more you involve the youth, they track with this project that, you know, year after year after year, they'll become involved in it. Um, and so we, we don't ask a lot. We ask the potters to make between 10 and 20 bowls and you get enough of those potters together and, and you end up with 100, 200 bowls. And that's kind of the way we started was, was with a, a small amount of bowls and a medium amount of people. And we would just all work together collectively. 
And it was interesting to see the types of people that you would bring in. We had young people, we had old people, we had people who'd never even thrown bowls before that wanted to come in. And then for me, this was the big moment. And, and this is after a, a long night of working. Um, and this was a couple of years after the fact. It was like this just exhausted stare, you know, the 10,000 mile stare that people get of being up for, you know, a couple of days in a row working on a project together of people who had never really worked together on anything before. And I think that's the that's the this thing is that you, you're binding groups of people together who are incredibly diverse, but they have a, a love of the, the project. And so let me try and my screen is going crazy here for a second. Where were we? Yeah, there we go. So, the, the, you know, y'all, this is it really started this way. And, and you'll laugh because um, the in the lower right part of the screen, there's some bowls with lids on them. And, and that was how we collected the money. And, and people said, you know, how did you, you know, what were your safety and your security? And I tell them, well, I just got two ladies from my church. <laughs> and I said, you know, nobody messes with the church ladies. And so this, you guys, this was it. It was in a hallway, in a building, and you can see there in the back, we had a cooler and a couple of flats of soda pop and some bowls, and, and we carved a pumpkin out, and we had a little stereo, and the guys who brought the soup just kind of set up there in the back, and, and y'all, we didn't expect to raise anything. We, we kind of expected it was going to be a failure, right, but, but it wasn't. And the number of people that showed up in this hallway to buy a bowl, eat soup, and then just sit around and talk to the point where last year before the COVID, we raised $40,000 in one day selling these bowls, same bowls, no difference. Okay. Um, you know, we have the luxury of being able to use some really large kilns, um, we have a population of students who are willing to help and work um, that, that they, 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 they don't mind being up. The young lady on the right side of your screen was the, um, her name's Taylor Clark and, and her, fa her father sadly passed away this last week or two weeks ago, but he was our um, soup guy. He owned a restaurant in town called Catfish and Company. And so we developed this relationship over 20 years. And, and y'all that are teachers, it's wild when the teacher's learning and, and, and the students become the teachers. And so understanding the, the, the world of Odessa, if you will, through the eyes of my students and seeing poverty is not like one color or poverty is not one kind of a mentality, but especially in a climate where you get a boom and bust, that, that it's, it's, it's expansive across the community. And so, you know, again, I, I'd never had any idea that I would become involved in this. This wasn't the issue in the beginning, but then it most certainly did become the issue as we went along. And so those nights where we're working, um, you know, we'll put in, you know, 12 hour days. Um, we, we also work an auction and I think that one of the things that you guys can, can consider is finding somebody who's just really good at getting people to give stuff, right? And, and then we will, again, raise as much in the auction as we do selling the bowls. And so that can be a, a real powerful part. Um, but it's, you can see here this kind of diversity of ages. And I, I don't know how you guys are with your group. But I tell people that Joel Locke, he was an attorney here in Odessa, was the youngest student I ever taught. He was in his 70s because Joel's attitude was he knew that he knew nothing. So he was willing to learn everything. Right. As opposed to the younger students who think they know everything, but end up knowing absolutely nothing. And so this project brings that generational group, you know, multi-generational group together all working for one common cause. And so what was fascinating, outside of the event, you would see these guys hanging out together at other events. 
And people would always say, well, how do you know these young kids? And it was like, oh, well, we do this project together. And so in, in a way, it created its own universe, which I thought was, was an amazing unintended consequence or, or event from, from, from the experience. Um, a lot of work with graphic designers. And this was the one thing that I think making sure that advertising is out there, you know, getting the radio spots, um, trying to get on the morning radio shows to talk it up, getting with the school teachers um, because, you know, they can get the kids involved and then they get the parents involved. Um, and then as the thing grew, we outgrew that little hallway and we had to move to another building. And you can see, I, I think just, this is about probably about five to six to seven years in, and, and, and we are literally at, let me get back here, um, yeah, uh, 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 almost standing room only capacity. Um, we, we had an event at this, at this, or a situation at this event where, where we had about $10,000 in cash, just a gigantic stack of $10 bills. And it was only about an hour into the event and, and everybody got nervous about that. And so we had to call the police to come just be with us to guard the money. <laughs> okay. Because we had, we had no expectation that the thing was going to explode like this. And, and so many people were going to start to come. And then in a weird way, it became kind of a political event too, where if you were running for office, you were going to show up at empty bowls and, and shake hands because there were going to be so many people that were there. And so to me, it's, it's fascinating to see that evolution of the event where all of a sudden these little humble pottery bowls became a catalyst for a lot of community conversations and linkage. Um, the catfishing company, you know, and this, this is an early presentation, but this was, you know, about four years in, um, and then there was Sid Clark. And, and I can't, you know, kind of tell you any more than this, that you've got to find one heck of a kind hearted restaurateur who, who is willing to, to work with you with the soup. And, and one of the things now that Sid has passed, sadly, we're looking because there's, there's, I don't think we're going to find a person with a heart as big as Sid's. Um, we're looking at maybe bringing in four or five different restaurants to help now be, because he would do it all. He would bring ice cream and tea and the soup um, and bread. And, and there was this just profound love in his heart for working with, you know, and his daughter was one of my students, but, but working with us to kind of help this event. And, and, and it was something we all look forward to every year. And so this is, you know, there's a profound loss with that. But just some other examples, um, kind of a, a strange lesson is even though the event would start at night, people would start showing up early, <laughs> okay? Because, the, you know, boy, by God, they wanted the, what we call the pick of the kiln or the pick of the litter. And so you, you would have people showing up well before the event was even gonna start. And, 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 and it was very difficult to say no. You know, we would just be like, oh, heck, just open it up. Soup's not going to be served for another two hours. But, you know, we're, we're about getting rid of these bowls to feed the poor. Um, so a lot of student leadership that happened during that time. Um, and so we would make student leaders who were responsible for kind of helping. And then that gave them something to put on their resume. And, and, and they were responsible for making sure that the soup got served. Um, they were responsible for making sure that the money, you know, was, was righteous and collected. And then we had student graphic designers that we picked up from either the college or the, um, the, the high schools that would come in and, and help us. And so you can kind of see these are, I think these are from another year um, of the event. And you just see this kind of group of people and it's, it's designed to be like, th there was no assigned seating. Um, people were encouraged to sit with people they didn't know and begin conversations. And so this gentleman over here, if you can see my mouse, is the, the owner of a bunch of liquor stores here in town. And that person right there was on the school board. Um, and, and, you know, 
kind of you don't make a hierarchy and then you find all these people sitting together and they 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 start a conversation and so the the things that have come as an aside from this event have been pretty amazing also um this young gentleman in, in the in the center there is 21 years old now and and he's actually studying ceramics at UNT and this was this is his mother and father um, they're both teachers here in Odessa. And, and so, you know, again, it, it's, you, you, you're, you're planting seeds in the ground and you're, you know, when they, when they sprout, it's pretty amazing. And so this young man is becoming one, one heck of a great craftsperson. Um, and, you know, and no doubt will stay in Texas. And so here's the math. One bowl equals $10. One dollar is four meals. $10 equals 40 meals. Let me go back. Okay, and so forty bowls is 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 four hundred meals, and so I'm watching this guy talk. I don't know what's going on. Uh, okay. Evidently, he's trying to get us to do something, and I don't know what it is. So um, <laughs> um, I don't know if we're going to get any wood turning done or not. I'm, I'm a little bit. Yeah, he's talking about pottery and doing it down in the old this area. And evidently he's trying to get us to do something, which I don't know what the hell is. But anyhow, I, I kind of apologize to you because I I didn't know what the agenda was. It may hang on. It may, it may kick off. On you need to mute there. everybody, please. Hang on just a second. Hang on a second. Poor Harry. It's okay. Uh, We're good. Okay, is everybody good? Yeah, yeah. we're good. Yeah, great, great. I'm not trying to sell you car insurance. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a, a good money raising project, looks like. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, let me let me just finish up here for a second, right? Okay, so here's the deal, right? Kind of 100% goes to the local food bank, right? Um, and and we're we're now at the point where year 20 we did um, about $40,000 for the event for the food bank, okay? Um, the, the, you know, we, we got music involved. So um, probably one of the coolest things that had happened um, in, the, in, in the event proper was that we were able to get the mariachi group from our local high school to perform at the openings. Um, and so we, we process into the event with the mariachi kids and then they, um, they open the event for us. And so there's a, this now this kind of big ceremony for, for the collection of the event. Um, let me show you a couple of other images real quick. Um, because you guys were talking about um, about the the working with school kids, if you guys can see this, let me see if I can bring it up a little bit bigger. Um, what's one of the things that I've become fixated on is about students who are involved in the arts in general at at middle school and high school and their increase in graduation rates. So that if a child becomes involved in the arts and then they're involved in some other form of extracurricular activity, and, and the intersection I think with your group is with possibly career and technical education, wood shop, metal shop education, that there's a higher probability that that child's gonna graduate from high school, okay? And, 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 and that's that, um, um, kind of unspoken truth that we all know because you're all up at nine o'clock in the morning to watch a presentation about a kid who uses art to feed the poor. So let me go here real quick and show you some other images, right? Um, 
share the screen. There we are. Hopefully you can see this, but the, the working with the West Texas Food Bank, um, and you guys have, a, I think it's called the South Plains Food Bank, that, that it got to a certain point where, where we could no longer, you know, and this is a, it's a good thing. We could no longer manage the logistical part of it and also be responsible for the making of the objects. And so we went to the West Texas Food Bank and said, hey, you know, you guys, we're, we're making these bowls, but we need somebody to take over the, the planning for the yearly event so that we can just get back to what, what, what we do best, which is the making. And so, you know, a couple of months worth of conversations and the food bank decided to take us on as one of their main fundraisers for the year. So then the, the kind of question and, and you know, the, the, that concern of, okay, why are we having this conversation is because now all over the Permian Basin, people know about the ceramics programs that we offer, okay? And before this, they didn't. There was nothing there that put us into the front of the community. And so one of the challenges is that that if we're going to do this for a profit, and, and, and I had you know, kind of made the comment the other day that I think after 20 years, one of the failings in this project was I didn't lift up individual artists as, as people to kind of help them with their careers. You know, if you're going to do this professionally, you want to, to, to do your kind of community service work, but you also want to be rewarded for it by then developing a, a network so that people come to your studio and actually purchase stuff. And so that's kind of, you know, and I make the joke for the next 20 years to help support the artists that are in my community by lifting them up during this event and highlighting and spotlighting them. But now I don't have to worry about you know, the venue, I don't have to worry about getting the potters together because they're gonna do that all on their own. And so the question then becomes, can that model be extrapolated to other types of mediums? And I think it can be. Um, I, I think the wood turners could, could do this. And I think it would be a, a heck of an experiment to, to watch as it grows. Um, and especially with this idea that the arts in service of the community um, to, to help w solve some of the biggest problems in our community. So kind of with that, I'll turn that over. I hope I didn't go too fast. You know, if there's any questions. So, so Chris, you, you work, your main partner is the uh, West Texas Food Bank. And y'all had an event in January at the, with the COVID going on. And, and so people can purchase a, a ceramic bowl for, 15 or $20 yep. is, is that kind of how it works. And they get a, uh, they get a bowl of soup or a snack yep. or something at yep. the event. Yeah. And tell so us, tell us how, tell us how that works a little bit. Okay. So this year, you know, and, and again, my soup guy was sick and, and then eventually passed away. Um, normally the way it works is um, bowls are delivered about two days before to the event space about a day before the bowls are all set up and then cleaned to make sure that they're okay. Um, the health department says that we can't serve soup in the bowl, right? Because then we would have to have every bowl inspected, but we can serve soup. And I make the joke in a cornstarch, biodegradable, politically correct bowl. But what usually happens is people just hand the people the bowl and say, put my soup in my bowl. Right. Um, and then, and, and, so we set it up like a, uh, if you guys can remember back in the depression um, or if you remember your history um, where you had soup lines. And so the whole thing is set up like a giant soup line where you get your bowl, you go through the line, you get your soup, and then you sit down at a table. In the beginning though, we didn't have any tables. You know, we just had people sitting on the front lawn of, of our art building. And, you know, we were, we were fairly low rent 
and and you know somebody collects the money um we've had people collect the money at the beginning of the event we've had people collect the money at the end of the event because usually what happens is after hanging out for a while people will go back through the line and collect more you know they, they they'll see things that they want and they'll go ahead and buy so it's not uncommon to see somebody walking around the event with a stack of bowls 10 or so bowls that they bought um, it becomes a great place if, if you have people that can work in sets um, to, to have like wedding gifts. And so people have kind of keyed into that, that you can buy kind of unique wedding gifts for people at this event. Um, you know, they, they, eat, they, they come, they eat the soup, and then they leave. Um, and then some people don't leave. They hang out for the whole event. And that event will last about three hours. We've, we've transferred the event to um, a Sunday. It was a calculated risk in Odessa, but we, we, we kind of looked at the times at which church got out in Odessa. And then we hit a lot of the, the churches to say, you know, instead of having like an after church meal, why don't you come to empty bowls? And, and you know, we thought that was going to be an epic failure. And it wasn't that, you know, we, we found that there was a population of people that would actually come so during COVID, the decision was made not to serve soup uh, for, for several reasons. We did not do as well as we had done the year before, but we still made about $5,000 in about two and a half, three hours for our food bank. And so it was, I, I, would, I would call considering the situation we were in, it, it was a success. And so... It was, it was held outdoors um, for social distancing. Um, you know, any of you guys who've been down, you know, because Lubbock gets the same thing we do. We, we had horrible winds that night, and they had planned on putting the bowls all outside that night. And so I had to show up and put the hammer down and tell them, no, we got to get these bowls inside for the evening or we'll be picking up pottery shards. Um, so, you know, we've had the event indoors, we've had the event outdoors, we've had the event in a hallway, we've had the event at a very, very high dollar um, conference center hotel complex like the Marriott. And, and, and I, I don't think any one of them is better or worse. In a way, I miss the old days when it was just a bunch of people sitting on a yard, you know, on the front yard of the art building because it was a little smaller and a little bit easier to handle. Um, but, but then it's not mine to control anymore. You kind of give a project like this up to the universe and it grows the way it's going to grow. And you all are situated in a, a location where you have a massive population of people and you already have an existing art structure, right? You already have incredible makers in your area. And so the expectation would be that if you started this, you will begin to collect glass workers and ceramics people who want to participate with you all. But if you guys can kind of grab this by the horns in the beginning, it's going to be the woodworkers who are leading the way. And that would be, I think, a unique, a unique phenomenon in the history of empty bowls. Is that it would, it, this would be a whole unique look at the way in which the program could evolve. And, and, and in a way, collecting more and more people, because you guys already have service as part of your component to the youth, right? You, you, yeah. You yeah. And so, yeah, that's our youth. Our youth deal started in October. And with with COVID, that's, you know, uh, we we have our we have a adult classes at uh, on Thursday nights and uh, we have these youth classes on Saturdays at the Y and we partnered up with the YWCA here in Lubbock. And uh, I'm just looking for some win-win deals. So kind of to answer Harry's question, uh, you know, he, he uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a little bit of a trade show, craft show, yeah. but at the same time, it helps other people in our community and it engages people. Here's, here's as a president of this club, my, my number one deal is how do I engage people to join us uh, to participate on some level, to write something, to take pictures, to make some things. To we we use our calendar is kind of upside down and inside out this year. Things are changing around uh, pretty rapidly, and and car shows that were almost free last year uh, that we did now the the 
promoter wants two hundred dollars for a booth, and I'm saying, well, yeah. I'm going to just have to rethink that a little bit because uh, I think you should be you should be paying me two hundred dollars to show oh, up yeah. because. Uh, uh, but uh, a little bit of a trade show, and and uh, in Lubbock, uh, if you were in Lubbock, who would you be partnering with to pull something like like this off, Chris? Um, you know, the, well, you've got South Plains Food Bank, right? They're good. I think that, you know, and, and for you all to kind of know how incredible some of the students in the ceramics program at Texas Tech are, we actually had students from Texas Tech drive to Odessa Midland to throw bowls with us for two days in a row last year. And so I think that there's a spirit at Texas Tech, especially probably with the students, that if they knew that something like this was going on, they would probably participate. Um, I think that your high school CTE programs would be incredible to talk to. Um, you know, I, we were laughing the other day. I was doing a thing at Nimitz Junior High School or middle school. And they still have their wood shop at Nimitz. But there's about this much dust on top of all those old powermatic pieces of equipment. And people have just been throwing chairs on top of that, right? And so that 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 whole wood shop was just scuttled, and and you're like, well, where is it that the children learn these skills? And lo and behold, coming out of the COVID, you know what we've all known our whole lives is that the hand, you know, the hand and the want and the will enhances the brain, you know, and that's just that old wood shop metal shop kind of mentality that I came out of as a kid growing up in Iowa and Kansas. That, that then goes on to create creativity that, that the whole of the United States is scratching their head and going, why don't we have persistence to graduation? Why are these kids bored in school? And it's because you've taken away their ability to make anything. And so I think, you know, for me, it's when you plug a kid into the ability to, to make something that's useful and, you know, not to, not to wax too philosophical, but the Japanese have a, a quote there's nothing beautiful that's not useful and nothing useful that's not beautiful, okay? And so the idea of, of what we do as a functional art form where people can, can use those things, they're not like a painting or a print that just sits on the wall and doesn't do anything, but that it actually becomes part of the living experience, very intimate experience between the hand and sustenance and food, um, that, that, that in, in a way, I think fundamentally human beings want to participate in that. And, and I think for the longest time, you know, especially when, you know, because I teach wood shop and metal shop um, also, and, and we don't think about those things as, as, as being intimate to the idea of human creativity. You know, we kind of thought of it as, oh, here's a job skill. But, but, you know, the idea of building a bowl or making a bowl um, is, is incredible. And, and we don't teach that. And so I think that what you're gonna find is people will come, whether they come quickly or they come slowly, but people will come to the project because of a desire to learn how, how to make things. And, and if you're the one that provides that for them, they're gonna stay with you. Right. And, you know, I've had some of the best luck with boys and girls clubs. Um, elementary schools have been incredible to work with. We made four. Are you ready for this? Four hundred. I'm going to give that number again. Four hundred dessert plates in 48 hours with a bunch of elementary school students. Okay. Okay. And, and it, was, it was just this almost maniacal desire to see if we could just do the project to have this round robin throughout those days between the teachers and the students going from different schools. And then we figured out a very simple way to make the bowls. And, and I was looking on the web, you can actually buy pre-made bowls. So it very well might be the painting and then maybe the coating of the bowl to kind of preserve it as far as, as the wooden bowls go, that could help bring even smaller kids into the idea of, you know, utilitarian woodwork. And so. Chris, we got go a couple ahead. questions. Sure. Go ahead, Steve. 
Uh, so my question is, uh, I think on a, in my, I, I don't know anything about ceramics, but I, I'm assuming that those ceramic bowls would be a little easier to make food safe or whatever. And I, I realize you said earlier that they would buy the bowl and want their soup in their bowl where you provided a, a food safe uh, bowl. But uh, I want, I'm wondering how limited wood turners would be to make a bowl like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know what kind of woods would be better than others. I don't know if there's one that's food safe and not. And I realize we could put a finish on them. That would be a food safe one. But uh, in my opinion, I think it would limit, we would be more limited on the bowls that we made out of the limited to the material versus a ceramic bowl. That uh, Your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I think if you go into it saying that these are purely decorative, right, then people are fine with it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I you know, I, you'll, hopefully you'll find this funny. A lot of the bowls that the children make, you, you could never eat out of, okay? But, but they, they, be, they become the most fought over bowls at the event because they are so horrendously ugly. And because they're so ugly, then they're, they're like the most unique ones. You know, I've got I've, I've got students who um, who can who can make like Tupperware, right? Okay, and and in a way, those are kind of boring. And so I, I think that that if if people understand that you, utility is different than yes, eating soup, but you know, for for just purely decorative things that sit on tables that are still in some way functional, you know, whether you set stuff in them. Um, you know, we always have the debate about whether or not you can microwave a piece of pottery. And I always say, look, there were no microwaves 7,000 years ago and, and, and they figured it out, right? So, so I, I just think you have to come to a kind of a consensus about if you're gonna do some that are, are utilitarian. You know, I just kind of go back to when I was growing up, all of our salad bowls were gigantic wooden turned bowls that somebody in Iowa City had made for my mom. And, and, you know, kind of back in the glory days of the, the late 60s and early 70s of the, um, of the kind of craft movement. And so, so, you know, that I think that is up to each individual artist who's making the bowls as to whether or not they want to go for something that's functional or something that's more decorative. And, and if it gets really, really decorative, put it in the auction. And then what we do is we do a, a, a what they call a blind auction. So, so nobody knows who's really bidding, but they see the dollar amount. And it's so funny to watch people get into like fights over the dollar amounts. And, and we've seen things that, that, you know, would only normally sell for 20, 30 bucks, go for as high as 300 because people get into an argument you know, over the blind bidding, if you will. And, you know, they're just watching those amounts grow. So I think it's doable. And I think that's the creative challenge is figuring out the right way to do it. Does that answer that? Any other well, questions? We wouldn't absolutely have to be bulls. I mean, we could make uh, other items as well, like you said, for the auction or whatever and i you know i think it's it's and then this is wild because you know you kind of understand the 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 are do we want to get involved in this you know guys i thought it was going to be one and done you know i i thought you know we'll do this it won't work i, I have little confidence in 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 my community to support this and I look back every year and I just have to laugh at my own ignorance. And then when you bump into people in the grocery store and they're like, look, we can't wait for this event again. Right. And, 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 and then the weirdest thing is when people start to rely on you and your group and your event as a sense of consistency in their yearly lives. If that makes sense. You know, because they look forward to that as a family event, because it is family friendly. 
You know, it's not a, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're so hard to find a, a community service event or a fundraiser that, you know, and, and, and look, we don't sell alcohol. You know, I, I'm adamant about that. You know, we, we've gone through those fights every year of people who say, let's sell beer or let's sell liquor. And I won't do that. Um, and for no other reason than it, it just seems wrong to do. There's no religious or, or, or ethical issue there other than the fact that it just seems wrong to sell alcohol at the event. And, you know, we got, we've, we've gotten a lot of pressure for people to say you ought to be serving beer. Um, but I won't do that. You know, that's kind of one of my ground rules. And I want the event to be so that a, a, a hundred year old person and a, you know, a three year old person can attend the event and that there's no issues there. And I think what you find with most fundraising events is that, you know, they're, they're, they're geared toward either very, very affluent people or, or, or they're geared toward adults with like adult behaviors, um, you know, the whiskey tasting events and things like that. And so, you know, kind of one of my deal breakers there was I want everybody. And, and if I'm going to have everybody, then I have to offer a, a very G rated program. And then what you find is, is that I think people appreciate that because there's so little that you can find to do that serves your community and, and, and then do, does allow a whole family to participate. And so in the beginning, I was also real adamant about keeping the numbers down to about 10 bucks. Um, but then the decision was made to raise it to 15 a couple of years ago. And, and it, it didn't really hurt us, but it was kind of like, okay, you know, we're, we're, I don't think we were pricing ourselves necessarily out of a market, but I loved it when it was still at 10 bucks because you would see kids show up with rolls of quarters, right? And they just wanted to participate. And, and it's like, that's, you know, if I can take a kid, you know, not to wax theological on you, but if I can take a kid who's five or six years old and teach them to be selfless in their heart, to give of themselves, to feed the other, right? And I can start that process when a child is five or six years old, I think I've helped create a better human being, right? And that's, and that is one of the kind of the goals of this project is to teach people that no matter how small you are or how little you have, you can help make the whole thing better. So I saw another question. Go ahead, Steve. I don't mean to be the one asking all the questions. I apologize. <laughs> uh, in my opinion, I think the, uh, the part of your your hook, so to speak, is to uh, feed the the needy, and uh, with those bowls, I, I think that's a big part of your hook. Um, I'm still kind of puzzled how a decorative bowl out of wood that isn't operative would uh, satisfy that hook that you have, where uh, where you're. I don't know uh, if you bought a bowl that fed fed the hungry. Mm -hmm had that bowl I think that's the best part of your hook what do you think well I you know I I like it's kind of like I said we will do as much in sales on the decorative stuff the non-functional stuff as we will in the functional right and so if you guys decided to take this on you would be collecting makers who make both you know you're not going to exclude the ceramics people or the glass people or you know, heck, if, if the quilters get crazy or the basket weavers decide to come on board, right? You know, you're, you're never going to say no to somebody who makes stuff with their hands. Um, you know, we, we, you know, and I will tell you, we have said no to commercial people, you know, because we, we don't want somebody doing, you know, a commercial enterprise with the bowl. So we want it to be things that are actually made by hand. And so, you know, the, the, we've negotiated with like the painted pottery people um, just to make sure that they're, they're not just, you know, pro providing something that, that you can't tell the human hand made. Chris, you know, can you hear thing. me? Yes, sir. I'm, I came in late, so I'm a little bit confused. What are you wanting out of us? Well, well I think that, that your president had, had asked me to come talk to you about this project because I think what it's done is heighten the awareness 
of the crafts and the arts for us in Odessa and Midland. And so I don't want anything out of you guys. I'm just here to present this to you as an example of how we brought an awareness to something in Odessa and Midland that was not there before through this community service project. And I think that if you look at the mission of your group moving into the future, it's kind of like, how do you get the youth involved? How do you spread the idea of, of, of your craft or your work to other people? And, and you know, sometimes, you know, and I'll, and I'll be honest, sometimes people just want their little club and they don't want anybody else in it, right? But, but I'll guarantee you that if you, and you guys are already doing this, so you know some of it, if you go to things like the Boys and Girls Club, where there's a child who's never worked with an adult to make anything, and you teach them how to do anything, you have transformed them, but you've also transformed you. And that kind of has been the biggest lesson. And so I guess what I'm asking you to do is take a risk. Right? Have, you, have you approached the club in Midland about joining this outfit? Now, which club? The South, the uh, wood turning club in Midland. Well, oh, you know, I, I have not had a lot of contact with them, right? I know, I know Jay Haney, um, he's uh, the head of our physical plant there, but I don't know if he's participated in any of this stuff. No, I don't hey, know. Harry, uh, Harry, let me jump in. Uh, I made a call to, to Chris Stanley because we're trying to fill out a counter with some excellent programming. And while people may be more at home uh, and have a chance to make some stuff, looking at this meeting on my screen, I'm showing about 20 participants. And, you know, I'm not asking you to make 20 bowls or anybody to make 20 bowls. But what if I ask you, everyone on this meeting to make one bowl? between now and this fall, if I could have one bowl from each person, maybe you have something on your shelf you started that didn't turn out quite right. It's not up to your standards, but what if you made one bowl and we could round up 20 or 25 bowls and take to the South Plains Food Bank and they have an event this fall and we could put one bowl on each table and it's going to be sitting there and, and, you know, I would, I would encourage you to, to put the date on the bottom, your name and whatever you want to put on there. And it would be a, a baby step for us to work with a nonprofit food provider in our community. And mm -hmm. what they can do with that one bowl on each table is a centerpiece instead of having a, instead of having a windmill or a, a basketball or whatever, whatever you come up with they could turn around and at the conclusion of their dinner or during, during their dinner, they could have an auctioneer come on and auction off those auction off those bowls that are sitting on the tables as table decorations. It's a win-win deal because we're going to have some people who never heard of South Plains wood turners and didn't, didn't know that we had trees in Lubbock, but it would be a, an opportunity for us to reach out and, you know, I'm, I'm Christian and I are pulling our hair out trying to get our, our members. We, we have people that we should have 50, 60 people on this. When I when I joined this down there and at uh, Oglesby's place and went into that building and climbed up those stairs, there wasn't I had a hard time finding a place to sit down. Uh, we have some excellent programming and, and with Scott going stuff and Jim Burt stuff that they produced. And it takes hours and hours to put those videos together uh, and uh we're trying to meet this, this challenge here, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, thinking outside the box and Chris helped me out with this. If the food bank had something and, and we had, uh, we could make trivets. Okay. A trivet would be something that they could use to put under their hot bowl of soup or, uh, and they could use it for their tortillas or they could use it for their bread or whatever. And that are, uh, the one that uh, Daughtry made down at SWAT with the concentric circles that overlap. Uh, we could also have a, a wooden spoon of some kind, anything that would fit this. And uh, in, in, in the old days, uh, you know, I would write up an article and take a picture and send it to the newspaper. 
Well, I went looking for a Lubbock Avalanche Journal newspaper Sunday for my wife. We shop at United Supermarkets, and, and guess what? The Lubbock Avalanche Journal is not always available. They, they bring, I don't know, it's a big store, but by the time I get over there, they're sold out of newspapers, and, or, they, or they're not even bringing them anymore. And if you, if you want one, it's $3, and it's getting thinner and thinner. And now I have an app on my phone, and we can, we can read the news on a phone or iPad or computer for free without having all the ads. But uh, just trying to scratch my head of how to grow our club and how to partner with uh, some other agencies in town. So, uh, and, and instead of us trying to invent the wheel, uh, Chris, Chris Stanley and his, his team have, have kind of got this figured out, I think. Chris, do you have a board or a governing body or who, who, who votes and who makes the decisions on where to spend your resources on something like a, 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 a bold project? How, how many of you guys have ever seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? <laughs> you ever seen that movie? <laughs> yeah, we're, we are a, a loose band of merry pranksters who, who it, it's the weirdest thing ever because once you start on this project, you're going to find strengths and weaknesses in people that you never knew existed because certain people will have a heart for this and for the organization. And I will tell you, 20 years, if somebody, and we actually had a kid do a graduate thesis project on the management of our project, right? Because he couldn't even explain how we got so much done. But what happens is, and again, I'll say this, the minute the heart becomes selfless, the minute the heart becomes selfless, everything else falls into place. When you say, I'm going to do this because I want to feed the poor, and if you can get five or six other people to say they're going to do the same thing, it happens because that energy just flows through the projects, okay? And what happens is they, people get mired in bureaucratic structures, right? And then they lose focus on the event. If, if, if you guys can get it where you say, hey, we're going to do – you know, each of us is going to do one thing. Then the question becomes just talking to the food bank and saying the next time you have your fundraiser, we want to participate, give us the date. And then everybody works toward that date. And so, I, I, you know, I, I can't explain it. Um, you know, it, it could be a God thing. It could just be a kind of a collective consciousness about the fact that deep down inside people really want to help solve problems we're just teaching them how to be, you know, we're the conduit for them to work. And, and that, that's the other thing you got to get used to is, is that there's going to be people that are going to show up that will have incredible gifts that might not be people that your group is used to dealing with, but they're really good at organization or they're really good at talking to people. And you have to allow them to come into the group also because the main goal and focus is, feeding the poor when you're doing this project. And so, so a hundred percent of the proceeds have to go to the food bank. If you want to use the term empty bowls. Okay. You know, and so you just kind of all agree that, 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 you know, that's the part of the process and then you move forward with it. And so, you know, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but after 21 years, we still don't know who's in charge. They, they refer to me as the grandfather, right? Okay. And, and, and which I took offensive when I had brown hair. And, and now it's like, oh, okay, I get to own that. And so, you know, if there's a problem, if there's a serious problem, they come to me. But the younger ones, and, you know, it's, and this is funny, guys, the younger ones are now in their 30s. We're, you know, kind of in a weird way, the ones who started with our project are in their 30s. And they have done this every year for 20 years of their lives, right? So people have grown up doing this project. So in a way, they, they've problem solved bigger issues than I ever could create for them. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to see the change. Yeah, but it's a slow process. You know, it's 20 years. Go ahead, Tom. And what's your question? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have participated in uh, empty bowls a couple of years when when I was a member, and I still am a member of the uh, Clay Guild here in Lubbock. Oh, way to go! 
It was Wishing. Wishing, wishing Bowls was the program name, I think. Yeah. But uh, if you really want to see what your stuff is worth, make, make some decorative items and put them out in the, uh, in the lineup. I've had people collect me. They come two hours early to collect my work. And uh, it's very gratifying. You, you will see, you will begin to get an idea of what's popular and what, uh, what you can do. So I highly recommend it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, probably the best story that I've got is I had a kid, and, and you all know this kid. He, 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 all he wanted to do was smoke marijuana and play video games. And his mom and dad wanted him to go to college, but he didn't want to do anything. He was really smart. He could have been a computer science major. But he just wanted to hang out and 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 make pots, and and through this process of kind of working him out of his baby brain selfishness thing, um, he he didn't want to participate in empty bowls, and he had said something really horrible about empty bowls and about the poor, and he was a very selfish kid at this time. But I begged him, you know, and this is that other thing about being a teacher. I begged him to put a bottle that he'd made in empty bowls. Okay, just one bottle. That's all I said. Just give me one bottle. Let me put it in. I'll put it in the auction and we'll see what it does. That one bottle sold for $300. Okay. And, and, and in that one night, that kid's whole attitude about things that he could do changed. Right. I mean, it was like, it, I, and I'm, you know, God thing, magic thing, whatever the heck you want to call it. All of a sudden, he knew he was responsible for feeding a whole bunch of people just from one bottle. And the fact that his bottle went for $300 encouraged him to get more serious. He went on, you know, and it's kind of like that magic story. He went on to get his MFA, right? Now he works in a university, right? And, and, and you know, I ain't going to lie to you. His mom and dad thank me profusely every time they see me. Because they, they can point to that one moment, that teachable moment where that kid's whole life transformed just because of that selfless, selfless act of giving the bowl. So there is that thing that, that, that is about your own creative spirit that happens. But then there's that other thing about the spirit that happens around the kid, if that makes sense, right? Or the person who's making. And so, you know, I, I validate all of it. I guarantee you it'll be one heck of a journey. Yep. So, any other questions? Uh, Chris, tell, uh, uh, back to wood turning. So, what we need to do is put our heads together, and and if we were to make more than you know more than one or two, uh, give us a, give us an idea of how we can make an economical bowl with a mini lathe or a full size lathe. Uh, you know, I have no idea how long it takes to make a clay bowl by, from start to finish. And I have no idea. What, also, tell us what's in that trailer that y'all have that says pots on the side of it. Okay. Uh, he's got yeah. this trailer he takes around to, to schools. And and uh, uh, let, me, let me pull up a picture of that real quick. Um, if, if I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of just a, it doesn't have to be a big bowl. It doesn't have to be a segmented bowl with a uh, uh, hundred or a thousand parts to it. And it, it simple is better sometimes. And uh, uh, in uh, Jim Bob's not on this meeting this morning. I wish he was. He's my he's my real uh, uh, Lubbock ISD retired shop teacher. But yeah. uh, it uh, I I would really like to I really like the trade shows. I really like making stuff with other people coming by. And we've got an invitation. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about what, what's coming up, but what would be, and this is for any wood turners out there, what's an efficient, fast, simple, low-cost way of making some bowls that might be something to consider? Because I, I don't make a lot of bowls. I have pin-making stuff, okay? He's got some pictures here of his trailer. Um, real quick, we'd gotten into a point a couple of years ago where the cost of bringing school kids out to the building to have an art experience 
um, became so great because of fuel costs that our local art departments were having to spend almost their whole yearly budget to put two, two bus loads of kids on the yellow dog buses and bring them over. Um, so my colleague, Mario, said, well, let's write a grant. And, and, you know, at that time, nobody was getting any kind of grants. And so this is our sixth year now, seventh year going into of having a national endowment for the arts grant through a project called Arts Works. And what we have is a trailer that has a whole ceramic studio and a whole printmaking studio in it. Um, we've got a kiln in there. We've got propane. Um, and, and so we, we, our jurisdiction is Lubbock to the Mexican border and then to like Van Horn to almost Abilene that, that we run the trailer. The most amount of kids that we've ever worked with was up in Lubbock at one of your high, um, high poverty elementary schools. We did 800 school children in one day through an experience of making art and then, um, the most t-shirts that we've ever printed in one day was about, um, you know, estimates vary, but it was right after the mass shooting in Odessa. We brought our rig, rig in and we probably printed around 2,500, 3,000 t-shirts in one day, right? We had two, two screen printers going and we, we printed the, the kind of iHeart, you know, Permian Basin t-shirts for free and gave them away. Um, so that, that's been another experience. And then with this, because of the grant, we were able to get, I think we now have 15 pottery wheels. So we can take a whole studio to go make wheel, you know, make bowls in one day. And then the only real issue is getting them ready for the kiln. Um, when you're remote, if the school actually has the facilities, we can fire them. Um, if not, we have to transport them back, but we can get 200, 300 bowls made in a day. There's no problem with wood turning. I think the challenge there would be probably letting the students have an experience turning a piece, um, you know, because you've got to have face shields and you've got, you know, there's a, a certain amount of safety equipment that you have to have. But, but y'all, we've worked with elementary school kids in an 1800 degree furnace. And, and we, we put those kids under the coolest leather aprons you've ever seen. And we have these little tiny face shields that they put on and these big gauntlet gloves that they wear. And they actually go into that 1800 degree furnace with a long pair of aluminum tongs and grab the pottery and take that out and then put it into combustible material. And we did that with about 800 school kids that were elementary school kids. And so, you know, kind of from my end of it, there's nothing that's not possible. You just have to get the smartest people you can involved in the process to figure out how to mitigate any risk that would come up. And so, you know, when you kind of put your head into the, how would we teach a group of school kids how to turn wood? It's probably going to be step-by-step -step processes, almost like an old Henry Ford assembly line where you would have different stations where people were at and then at the end of it instead of each kid having a bowl you might have 10 or 15 bowls that were made by different people working on different pieces of equipment so that's kind of where my head would go with that you know te teach them teach them old school assembly line production you know th this is the way a factory would work and this is how a factory back in the day would make things that were unique and hand skilled. And, you know, if I was doing an art history lecture on it, I would talk about Tiffany lamps and Tiffany vases and, and how those were teams of craftspeople who worked together to make incredibly beautiful things that now sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, the, the, that classic, the classic craftsmanship mentality that existed, you know, kind of, in the ninth, you know, you know, eighteenth, nineteenth, and early twentieth century, I've come up with a way to find some. Uh, oh, it's really not unique. I found this on YouTube, but I've taken some scraps and uh, put them in a, a plastic bowl. <clears throat> uh, put a piece of a larger piece of wood in the middle and pour some epoxy in there, yep. and uh, 
that's really easy. And it, I'll show this. It's not that great, but this is the oh. first one I've ever made. And it's just scraps of wood. You know, yeah. there's nothing to this. Now, it does require a, a pressure pot. But, man, there's there's nothing to that. That's literally in its scraps. It's scraps yeah. of wood. Yeah. So that, there's you an idea. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think what this does to, uh, you know, and, and for all of us, you know, it's, it's when your brain has to think about a different way of solving the problem, you know, making a better mousetrap. And then you put into the equation this kind of what's the population we really want to work with, you know, middle school students, high school students, college age students, right? Then you start to solve for how can we do it? And I'm not going to lie to you, you're going to screw up, right? You know, we've had some epic failures. Um, you know, we've gotten to places before and our, our propane tanks were empty because somebody was supposed to fill them up and they didn't. And then you're running around town look like a chicken with your head cut off and, you know, in Lubbock or in Midland trying to find a propane place that's open. Right. Um, so there, there's going to be these epic highs and epic lows, but then you just have to embrace that as part of that process, because the bigger goal is trying to help feed the poor. Right. And, and, you know, sometimes you have to do a do over. Um, there's no, there's no better experience than practicing a lot before you go and do something so you can problem solve what's going to happen. And then if you have, you know, a group of kids like the, the, I think probably we've learned the most about how to do this from like the boys and girls club kids, because they're high risk. They have little or no discipline. They've never really taken a lead from a parent because I don't know if your guys' clubs are the same as ours. Most of those kids don't have what you would refer to as parents. So they're, they're kind of like these beautiful, wonderful, wild children. And, and if you can get them to focus on something and get them to complete something, well, heck, that's, that's like winning the Super Bowl. Right. You know, they, that, and then boy, the next day they're going to show up and they're ready to work. You know, and, and, you know, you give that kid the sense of pride of making something from nothing and, and you know, kind of hang with this thought for a second. We, we tend to, especially with the youth anymore, make everything an easy to digest kit. You know, it's kind of like failure is not an option because we're already telling you how to stack the Lego bricks. So it's no longer that we're giving you the Lego bricks and you get to use your own creativity we're making the thing so that you can't fail. Well, I think part of the beautiful part of these types of projects is failure is always an option. So, you know, your level of awareness is heightened because it's not something that's easily done. So then your thrill at a victory of a kid making a bowl is real and sincere and just as much as their thrill of making the bowl. Because you're kind of like, this might not work. And if it works, we're incredibly lucky. And it means something that's very special. And so not, not that, that that's something that you guys would get involved with, but we taught a, a group of 200 kids um, before the COVID shut down how to make um, drought watering pots that are called Oyas. And we made a Henry Ford assembly line and just went through so that no kid built one themselves. They all built parts and pieces of ones. And it was amazing because at the end of the day, every kid had an Oya, but that wasn't the intent, right? But that's what happens when they start working as a team. And that's the other thing that, you know, like look at the way the world is now. There's so few people that actually want to work together on a project. But then when you make it into this kind of assembly line thing, and, and, and the kids get into it. And so I'm sure there's a way if we looked at your processes that we could come up with a way that it could be an assembly line thing. And then quite possibly at the end of one or two days, they actually have a bowl. Right. And the way we do it with the club is, is we always make two, one for the kid to take home and then one for the food bank. Because it's important for them to have a tangible reality of that experience. Um, you know, and I think it's also important for their parents to see or the caregiver to see, oh, my God, my child did something that's actually constructive. And so. Hey, this is David. 
Hi, David. Yes, sir. Hey, I, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, I noticed with your pottery, people can start out in just a few, with very little instruction, probably very little learning curve, learn how to turn these bows, and y'all can turn out a bunch of them. Yep. With wood turning, it's a little different. We we have no. we've we've got some youth. And I, unfortunately, I haven't been able to attend the meetings, but I will shortly. Uh, in training them, they're learning. But I, I like the idea of where we can teach them how to do it. And we may not can do this on a grand scale of what you guys do, but I was thinking of, of two or three things. One is we're always trying to grow our club. So we, as a club members, might, could get with the food bank and like you said a while ago make these centerpieces and we can start out like that so that and we'll donate our bowls my bowls i make are simply decorative they they don't hold water because i don't fill in the cracks and we have all these unique bowls and have them as a centerpiece okay and at the end and and at the whatever we're at, that we let that be known that these bowls have been donated. And after the meeting, they will be auctioned off to support the food bank, just going for that, for instance. And something of that nature, that in two would, would get us some recognition in the community that we are wood turners and we do make things. And then... Mm -hmm we could have the group of youth that we have once we get them to a certain point in their learning mm -hmm. to have bows and we can say this group of kids have turned these bows yep. and what they've turned we are going to donate the proceeds of that to projects much like you do uh, because you know it, it even me, I, if I'm turning a bowl, it's going to take a couple of hours at least, or three hours, just to turn it, not sanding it, finishing it, and the whole works. Yep. And when I start out, I have an idea of what I want, but when I end up, that idea has got <laughs> hit in the... I may make a mistake. Now, I don't know you've heard this. A mistake, to me, is a design opportunity. Exactly. A happy accident. Happy accident. So I can see a lot of good that you do, a lot of things that we could probably incorporate into our stuff sure. using some of your already figured out ideas. So uh, what you do is wonderful, absolutely gorgeous and great. Uh, and that many bows, and I can see for the people, and even, you know, you having the soup club, you get 10 bucks a bowl, you can make some money. You can sell that stuff for $10. Now, uh, sometimes we, we're trying to raise money, but we outprice ourselves. You know, okay, come in and have a bowl of soup for 20 bucks. Yep. You get a bowl. Well, <laughs> how many are you going to get in? Like you say, you're not getting the family in there with uh, four kids, but you could get that family with four kids or teenagers or whatever for the ten dollar price. Because I don't know what it, how much money you have involved in a bowl of, with the clay and stuff. I know that your turning table. I don't know what they cost, but with us being wood turners, there's a lot of a lot of time yeah. and, and, and tools involved yep. but your ideas i think are great and i think there's a lot of things that we could skip right along with you on what we've got up here in love it's just a matter of us getting together as a club and brainstorming what we need to do or what we can do or what we want to do yep and go from there it may start out small but you don't get nowhere until you got your path I'll be quiet and thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, if if you look at, you know, and, and because of, I study ceramics, the Japanese history of the unknown craftsman, that, that was the kind of 
impetus behind this project is that that you're going at it fundamentally from an idea that nobody knows who made the pieces. Um, and so, you know, you could be looking at the work of a master, you could be looking at the work of a student. Um, and, and so that was kind of an idea I wanted to also throw in there um, because the, the who made it becomes important eventually. You know, I, I have certain eccentricities with the way I work where people know they're my bulls versus somebody else's. And there'll be people that come looking for those certain bulls, even though I don't put my name on. Them, right. And so that's something else to consider, too. And then it becomes kind of a hunt for understanding the aesthetics of the maker. Um, but you're right. You know, you got to remember this all started in a hallway with 100 bowls, you know, in a hallway with 100 bowls. That was it. And, and there was no expectation that this was even going to work. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I, I laugh because my my expectation for it to work was so low that I feel I feel like I, you know, there's a lot of humility there because I had no idea what it would become. Right. I didn't I didn't go into it thinking it was ever going to be massive. And so, you know, and, and I I love the idea of making the centerpieces. We had a glass blowing rig that we brought in for two days. Um, the a couple of kids that graduated from Texas Tech and they came down and, and blew glass for two days with us. We made 30 centerpieces in, in those two days out of you know fairly big glass vases. And, and had those auctioned off at one of the empty bowls. And that was absolutely amazing, right? So I think the idea of doing centerpieces would, would be good like that. I think you would, that would be a home run, um, you know? And then I would, you know, what I would love to do is, you know, kind of when it sounds like the COVID thing's cleaning out, our administration is going to allow us officially to travel in the fall because we've been told that we can't, take our trailer out or do anything like that. I would like to come up to Lubbock and watch you guys work and see, see what we could brainstorm with maybe in the fall, right? To, to, to just come see, a, see the, the process, the way it lays out and see if there's not different ways we could look at, at, um, at kind of skinning that cat, so to speak, right? Uh, jumping in here on the youth, uh, we're working with AJ McLeod with the YWCA here, and uh, we're we've been as everybody knows we've competed with uh, we've competed with a blizzard, and we've competed <laughs> with we've competed with middle school basketball tournaments, and uh, then we're partnered with the with the Y. And one Saturday they uh, they called off our 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 twice a month Saturday class because they were. Uh, tearing up the uh, uh, parking lot where we park. So it's kind of, uh, we did have our last class, we have five kids show up on a Saturday, some of them at nine, some of them at 10. And at the end of the, end of the time, uh, I had Robert Suttoth, Jim Bob, and uh, I can't remember right off. I'm going to leave someone else, myself. And uh, we had our pin blanks already pre-drilled and glued. And we got those kids started on some pins and, and by 1130, we had, uh, we had seven pins made and uh, one little, the little guy had a red oak pin blank and he got a little greedy with his dull tool and, and broke his pin, one of his pin blanks. And uh, I said, well, no big deal. We'll just, uh, you know, you just, you make this one, this other, this good one, and we'll make it into a keychain. And uh, so we got a keychain made and uh, uh there was a tournament in Dallas and half of them were gone to the tournament. And, uh, we, we had a really good time with them making uh, some Christmas trees, you know, that, that, that looked kind of like this kind of a Christmas tree out of, out of some logs. So that the, it was pretty fast. Jim Bob showed us about making those things at a previous meeting. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a part, it's an art object. So, uh, don't worry too much about the functionality, whether it's going to hold a multiple meal in there or not. It's a, it's an art art object. And uh, uh, one of the galleries here, when you go to his place, he's got some caps out there 
and he's taken a donation for a Charles Adams Studio Project cap. So he's always, he just takes a donation for that. And we, we've done that a little bit. Uh, just trying to get out a counter and look at it a little bit just for everybody's benefit. And if you, if you want to <laughs> look, into a, look into a public venue uh, coming up next weekend, Cook's Garage, a Friday afternoon and a, their main day is a Saturday, but they want 200 for a booth. Okay, I filled out the form, but I didn't, I didn't pay for it. Uh, I got a letter from the South Plains Fair for eight days, a 10 by 10 booth with electricity in that merchant's building. It was free two years ago. Uh, the fee for that is, is now $775. I think it's, a, it's a, a good event, but I don't think it's worth that much unless we produce some high-end stuff and unless we have uh, uh, get lots more involved. You know, it's, uh, it, it was a challenge to get it done. And, and, uh, but at, at that price, I'm going to have to look at some other things coming up. Uh, Buddy, can you want to chime in and tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, Scottish Rite car show and the date? And, and you know, this is a, a new deal for them, so it might be something to look at. In, I think it's April. Tell us about that, car, that Scottish Rite car show. Yeah, it's April the 10th. Uh, uh, we hope to have about 75 to 100 cars out there. It's free to the public to come out and see. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, this is our first annual. We're going to try to do this every single year. We're selling uh, sponsorships for people to be out there. And then you can sell wares for these sponsorships and things like that. Uh, we haven't approached any vendors at all to do it. There are going to be some food trucks out there and things like that. But uh, it's a great time to come out and see some hot rods, some show cars right here in Lubbock at the Scottish Rite building right there on the South Loop uh, and the flyover right there by the Chevrolet house. Uh, we'd love to have everybody come out. 100% of the proceeds go to the Scottish Rite Dyslexia Learning Center right here in Lubbock. We teach over uh, 450 students every year about dyslexia, one in 10 uh, children right now have dyslexia and we're teaching these children how to read and write and get on with their life and be productive citizens so all that money is staying right here and that's what uh, next year I hope to expand it out to vendors like you Ken, and you know to the South Plains uh, wood turners and things like that where uh, y'all can get out there and do that right now we're just kind of feeling our way like I said this is our first one uh, hope to make it a great thing, and I really am also intrigued about this because the uh, Masonic Lodge in Abernathy and everything like that. I'm thinking about having a bazaar for the city of Abernathy, and inviting vendors as uh, wood, the wood turners and uh, the clay uh, guild and everybody else to come out there and sell their wares to benefit the Masonic Lodge in Abernathy, things like that. So I'm really interested in, in what we're going to produce here, and I think it could be something good for both the community and ourselves as far as it recruiting members and participants. Any questions, just call me. <laughs> okay, you, uh, uh, no plans for vendors? Could there, would there be, would they consider us, letting us have a table this year? And- you know, uh, The thing is that we've made no provisions for electricity or anything like that. So I know we've got to have our lays out there to make, to make things work. You know, we can't pedal turn uh, well you <laughs> did <could>. one time <laughs> yeah, exactly. but uh you know uh, pedal turn a lathe but that would be pretty interesting to set up something like that out there too but uh i'm very interested in making this um, or open car show and everything for vendors and more like a bazaar uh where we have vendors and people come out there and, and benefit both the community and our local clubs okay and uh, Lubbock Arts Festival is on for July for two days. And that's really been our, our, big, our big demo. Uh, I don't have the dates right here. It's on the webpage if I wanted to look it up here. Uh, and so uh, uh, July 23rd, 24th, 25th, Lubbock Arts Festival. Make some toys, make some tops, make some uh, the tops 
you know, and a nice looking top and, and those kinds of things engage our, our, our guests. And uh, we're able to uh, make some of those, but we sold so much stuff at the fair two years ago. And, and we have things at the Groves library right now. We have some things at the Parkway library right now. And I think Joe Bob has a display set up for the garden arts center for the month of April. That's the, all the information I have about it. And, uh, uh, would like to, to look into that and, uh, uh, just, you know, I'm always open to ideas of how we can recruit people and then maintain our current people, uh, and engage them with some quality programming. Uh, I'm ready to get back to a face-to-face -face type situation. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a face-to-face -face type activity and, uh, Jim Bob is on the schedule with Ken. Ken, you want to tell us what, what Jim Bob's playing, thinking about for April on a, on demo? Give me a minute to figure out how to work this machine. Oh, okay. We uh, can hear you. do a wall hanging, uh, I think he calls it a wooden wall, a wall pocket. Uh, it's a preparation for his uh, demo at SWAT. Should be very interesting. Uh, we've also got a man from the East Coast that's going to be with us in uh, June. He's been uh, meeting with us on Thursday morning, uh, Bob Fellows. And uh, then in... Uh, July, I believe we're going to have a man from tech talk to us some more about uh, design and uh, some more stuff along the same thing that Chris has been talking about this morning. So we uh, should have a pretty interesting uh, summer ahead of us. If uh, you want to demonstrate, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody that wants to bring something up. Uh, I'm on any of the list. Just give me a holler. I'd be more than willing to discuss anything with you. I don't really want to do a, a demo, but I sure would like to use that lathe. We might farm something out and rent it to you for a small yeah. fee. I, I'm kidding. I love that Powermatic. I don't have one, and it sure is nice. Yes, sir. I know what you mean. Um, this is Ron. I don't know if uh, if I come up on the screen, but yeah, I hear you. you're you're a little shady, but we we hear you and see you. Well, uh, you know, you, we're going to have this uh, demonstration having to do with bowls. Now, I didn't know it's going to be ceramic, but and that's fine. Uh, you know, we have the uh, the SWAT has the bowl of courage, which is. Uh, you're kind of limited because they have to be what about six inches by six inches. Uh, uh, so they're kind of large maybe, but, uh, I've had, um, uh, a half a dozen to a dozen, uh, uh, you call, uh, just, just lumber, uh, having to do with, uh, uh, when, when large pipe is, is being transported. And they were about eight feet long. And they were about inches by seven inches. And one day I, well, I kept them and, they, and I was trying to see what was inside. And it, I planed them down and, and they're kind of, uh, kind of interesting looking. And of course you can, I don't know if you can see the circle on it. Uh, you can get a couple of, uh, like a bowl blank out of it. Uh, this happens to be not quite two inches thick now. I think they start out a little thicker, but uh, I, I cut a simple bowl out of it and it is relatively seasoned for years. So it is tougher than nails, <laughs> but uh, it ends up being rather beautiful, I think. Absolutely. And this has absolutely no finish on it. So it, it's been it's been cut out and sanded, and uh, I'm willing to donate all of those boards out of my yard. 
to be cut up into bowl blanks and that could be mass produced, be chopped off, uh, rounded out, uh, yeah. band sawed, or just, uh, I usually just cut the corners off. And so I start with a, an, uh, an octagon and uh, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, Henry Ford would probably type of uh, thing probably get a bunch of these blanks knocked out and, and roughed out into a simple bowl. Now, you know, obviously it, it could be a more of a bowl, you know, like a cereal bowl site rather than whatever kind of simple bowl shape you'd call this. But uh, that went fairly quickly. Uh, you know, uh, David talked about it takes a couple of hours probably to kind of, kind of knock out a bowl. And once you get a blank, ready to go uh it sculpts out pretty quickly if you if you keep a couple of tools sharp uh so that's about all i have to say i had to put a little bit of a uh, deal end up with a few checks in it and i added a little bit of had to add a little bit of uh ca glue here and there just to i think i still have a little hole i don't know if you can see the glossy in the bottom here but uh it won't hold soup, maybe, but uh, you could <laughs> you could put mazzola oil on it and, and use it uh, as a salad bowl because it's going to get oily later anyway. So it's not not that you want it as a functional bowl, but it could be functional. Uh, one other thing that I always end up with is that I have a I have the uh, an oak tree and a sycamore tree and a couple things. I keep ending up with these round tuits. You know, they're, they're just a <laughs> and they're pretty i don't know what you do with those, but uh you know people like pocket pieces you know i have an old uh half dollar that i carry people say what's that it's a half dollar so anyway that's all i had to say but uh like i say i'm i'm willing to mass produce all of that lumber old uh uh i, I call it dunnage it's just uh had, been, had come in between some large diameter piping. So there you go. Sir, sir that's, that bowl is beautiful. Well, thank you. It's, yeah. it's, I'm not very good. I just like to do stuff. Well, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. so, so there was a, a, a movement in, in, in Japanese art. It was called the Menge movement. And, and it was all about making utilitarian things that were incredibly beautiful. And I think that that's really what we all do is we take wood and we turn it into something absolutely beautiful or we take mud, and turn it into something beautiful. And, and personally, I, I just think we've lost that in our culture. Absolutely. You know, it does, you know we, we kind of we focus more on other cultures that have done it. We don't focus on our own culture, but there's a perfect example of, of how the, the story there is going to be what sells the project. You know, this sure. is where this came from. This was part of the industry. And then we took this. This would have been something that would have just been thrown out. But then here's this beautiful object that came from it. So th there's your story right there. Well, the, you know, as far as having, you know, you commented about uh, uh, having a, uh, a few, yeah, two to four pieces, you know, like for wedding gifts, mm -hmm. you know, they'd be similar. And, and with this blanking, uh, there could be a bunch of similar things made as well as there's room for a little bit more, I'd call it creativity uh, in, in a bowl shape. Yep. A, lot of, a lot of different opportunities there. Absolutely. And, and then what you're going to find is, you know, and this is, it, it's, I think it's funny, but it used to be for me, making 50 bowls was a pain, right? Yeah. And, and, and now making a hundred bowls is not a pain, right? For and sure. so it's, it's your whole awareness of your skills, your thresholds for focus change incrementally because now you say, oh, I'm gonna make this one different. I'm gonna make, you know, it's like you say, all of a sudden you become incredibly fixated on that bowl shape. And, and, and then people look at you funny because all you want to do is talk about the bowl shapes, you know? Yeah. And so I, I estimate probably I'm close to almost 10,000 bowls on this project and I still am not happy with the bowls I'm making. 
but boy, by God, can I talk to you about bowls? Start uh, making coffee cups. <laughs> no, there, there's a story they tell in ceramics about the guy who makes coffee cups. He goes to the show with a hundred coffee cups, comes home with a hundred and one. Because <laughs> nobody, you know, they're not going to pay the money for a coffee cup when they can get one at Target for three bucks. You know, yeah. yeah. And I, and I love coffee cups. Sure. Uh, I, I know. I've been to craft shows up in uh, uh, like Crowd Claw, Crowd mm -hmm. Croft, and places like that. Yeah. And they're beautiful cups yeah. and things yeah. they do up there. But you know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, tell you, I, I tell you what we've been making a lot of recently. We started a project called Mugs for Mutts and Cups for Cats, right? And so we've been making these little Japanese whiskey cups called Unamis, and, and those things are a hit, right? Is that supposedly in the whiskey culture, a lot of people want to drink whiskey out of ceramic cups now because it's shishi to do that. And so I don't know if there's a, a similar thing with wooden cups for drinking some kind of a liqueur out of that would be like, you'd be going back to the middle ages probably to find that historical precedent. But yeah. If you leave yeah, the so. whiskey in the oak cup long enough, it becomes oak aged. There you go. <laughs> see, there you go. There, there's your next story, right? <laughs> no. Oh. Also, I've got, you know, it's funny. I made this. And if I sell it as a cutting board, I can probably get twenty or thirty dollars. But if I sell it for as a charcuterie board, I can uh -huh. get twenty or fifty dollars. <laughs> and, and look at look at how wonderfully hip you are with your charcuterie yeah. boards. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. You know? You, you didn't know you were hip. I didn't. Right? I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you're 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 on the wave. And so I think that that's, it doesn't have to be a bowl. You know, it's just the name of the project evolved into empty bowls. Right. And I think you guys, you guys could take it in your own beautiful direction, you know, and I just, it would be fascinating to see how Lubbock would evolve. With it. Right. No. So. Well, I think our association with the YWCA hey is a big help. Yeah. It's really going to yeah. turn out yeah. great. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, y'all, I'm, I'm running for political office in Odessa. I got put on the school board through a series of very unfortunate events. Oh. And so I, I, I have become a politician, even though I had no desire to ever become a politician. Um, so I am off to a campaign event this morning um, for my run for school board. So um, you guys, thank you so much for letting me participate today right and and if i can be of any service in the future i'd love to bring our trailer up and do some kind of a joint event with you guys okay. now can i have your permission to put this recording on our website for oh yes guys? yes you may yeah oh yes 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 of course all right thank you so well chris thanks so much for joining us and if you get your 2021 calendar out and if you're hauling your trailer or your pots or anything to love it yeah. you know there's some a lot of us are working a lot of us are not working and uh uh just just keep the lines of communication open and and uh uh you, you we've just scratched the surface on 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 your process for these things and uh gosh your plate must be full between uh uh, especially throwing in school board stuff. <laughs> Thank you for your service on that. Cause I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm a retired teacher and I'm, I'm not going to have anything to do with that, but uh, 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 well, we're, we got some ideas planted and, you know, we can round up some bowls and we can, we can get a first step going with this and it, uh, the, the, our deal with the why they're going to, they're going to add on to that building. And uh, they, uh, there's a lot of interest in what we're doing over there. We've got some good equipment. And got some good volunteers. Always, always needing volunteers that uh, have a little time. But uh, thanks again, Mr. Mr. Chris. And I put those web pages of yours on. Uh, borrowed the stuff from Odessa American, and I found the USA Today right up. And uh, boy, that's that's very impressive. And uh, we sure appreciate you. We may have you back in, in at a later date. All right, sirs. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks. Chris. All right. Thank you.
Go ahead, Kent. Uh, uh, Jim, do you want to? Did you have something? You unmute yourself and tell us what you were showing us there for a second. Uh, Jim Harris, you're still mute. You're muted, Jim. <laughs> there you go. Now, nope, oh, nope. You're now still speak. muted. There. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just. Uh, uh, he was talking about you know taking a uh, a, a cast off a cast off item and turn it into something useful. And, and, you know, he was, I just made a bench mallet, a big one. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get my camera to pick it up because of that virtual background. <laughs> well, hey, hey, Jim, just hold it still for a second. Uh, give us a, a side view there in a minute. Just kind of hold it still. When it's still, it comes in a whole lot better. Looks like uh, well, looks like some oak there. Yeah. I think it's white oak. <laughs> Put it closer to your face, Jim. There you go. Back, right in front Turn of you. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Background kills you. Yeah. Yeah, background kills it. <laughs> ah. So Kent, are we not going to do the co show? Uh, I turned in a form, but uh, when when she told me two hundred, uh, yeah. I'm I'm going to go out there and take my pins, and I'm going to take some flyers, and when they roll in with their cars and they get their cars unloaded, I'm just gonna I'm going to take a hundred flyers and a hundred business cards and just tell them you, know, you may not you may not know about us, but. Uh, we're looking for people that like to know a little bit about tools, materials, and processes, and uh, and just do a little prospecting that way. That's right. Uh, just go, just go down the road and just pass them out. Just go down the car show and yeah, and and uh, ask them to take a look at the web page. And some of these guys have.